Sure. Yeah, we'll wait about another minute. Okay. People trying to filter in. What are you doing the rest of the year? Any other conferences? Excuse Any me? other conferences the rest of this year for you? Uh, Synergy Barcelona. All right. We'll have a booth in Barcelona. Oh, cool. What about so, uh, like VMworld or? Uh, we still don't know. TechEd? TechEd, yes, but yeah. maybe, but not VMworld. Yeah. For now, not VMworld. Just want to, to focus uh, yeah. on the business. Yeah, sometimes there's too many, too many conferences. Yes. For us, the most important is Barcelona because uh, it, it's our Euro European market. We know almost everybody, so right. it's really important to be there. Do you have a time? Or are we close? Did you get started? I have the same. Yes. Okay, why don't you get started then? Mm -hmm. Mike? Yes. You're on? Okay. You guys hear me okay? Not enough? Need more? Put it closer? Is it? The volume okay? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, same for me? Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, thanks everyone for coming to the uh, Virtual Desktops Best Practices session. Uh, I'm Sean Bass. I'm Pierre Mamignon. And we titled this session Virtual Desktop Best Practices Chapter 1 because we have the intention to make sort of uh, multiple series of these best practices sessions that we'll do at, at various conferences uh, like Brightform. If you guys are on Twitter, please feel free to uh, tweet about the session. Our uh, handles are here, and of course, Bryform. You don't really need the, uh, the hash symbol in front because it is a pretty unique tag, but feel free to tweet about this uh, if you guys would like. So really quickly, a bit about myself. I spend about 90% of my time uh, consulting out in the field. Most of the companies I consult for are large organizations. I don't do a lot of small, medium consulting, so my perspective on things sometimes are a bit slanted towards uh, larger organizations. I work a lot, uh, obviously, in the Chicago market. I'm from Chicago, so this is a great conference for me because I don't have to actually fly anywhere to travel to go to it. Aside from the consulting that I do, I also teach an independent training class on ZenApp and Zen Desktop with, uh, with Benny Trich. And I speak at events like uh, this event, uh, Citrix Synergy, VMworld, Tech Ed Tech, those types of things. And then the last thing I'm doing this year is I've done uh, probably about six desktop virtualization roadshows with Tech Target, which is the same parent company that works with Brian Madden. And uh, if you're interested in that to see if there's one in your city, please uh, check out that URL and uh, hope to see you at one of those events. So uh, I am Pierre Mamignon. You may know me from CitrixSouls.net. And um, I have been in the Citrix consulting business for 12 years now, mainly dealing with large organizations also. That's where I've developed all the automation skills. And uh, I recently founded my own software company, providing a new product called VOEM and uh, providing really fast logons with easy administration and uh, all UAM flavors. Uh, so if you want to try it, we'd be pleased to send you an evaluation key. Just send an email to the Bry Forum address. And uh, if you want to talk more about this, just feel free to ping me or talk after the session. But we won't be talking about VM specifically in this session, so just yes. be aware. We're talking about some general things. So uh, we are working hard to deliver next generation desktops. Uh, it could be VDI, it could be um, Xenap, it could be FAT also. We, for, for we, uh, oh, we forget about FAT because we have still lot, lots of FAT desktops. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, what are the users expecting? Um, that, that's what we will deal about. Then we will focus on some points. That's also why we have called this session chapter one because there, there are so many things to say about it. And we mainly talk about hypervisor storage, Active Directory, and UEM, and Xenap Xen Desktop specific optimizations. And we'll have a summary at the end. So uh, just to introduce the topics, we are dealing with more and more complex environments. Um, we, we can have virtual desktop, virtual apps, uh, physical desktop, physical deployed apps. And um, sometimes you also have to mix all these technologies just to create the new user workspace. And um, 
even if we can do um, all complex stuff, we still have to focus on the user experience and uh, how to provide the best desktop for every kind of users. I think we can yeah, just skip this, skip this sure. one. Yes. So uh, from what we are seeing and uh, what is always or well, sometimes forgotten is that even if we have uh, really technical complex desktops with physical virtual apps, virtual desktops, users are still expecting the new shiny desktop to be as fast as possible. And that's all they will remind. They will say, wow, it's fast. Um, if it's not, they will say, oh, it sucks. And they will tend to go back to the old desktop saying it was better. So we will focus on very fast logins, for example, because that's the first things the user are seeing. Then they also expect an improved stability. For if you are using VDI or XenApp or even RDS, you don't want lots of disconnections, you don't want lots of crash, and you want really stable performances. Also, with all iPads stuff, users now expect a tablet effect, which means you click on the app, it's launched, it's working, it's fast, it's responsive. And we also have to, fun to focus on applications responsiveness. And uh, the consistent user experience is key to, to get um, a successful project. Also, uh, users now want improved flexibility, which means um, years ago, uh, and we were talking about this uh, in our Bryform London session, you can also check this uh, if you want uh, more about this. Uh, users now don't want IT to say, you have to work like this. Users are saying, we are working like this and we want IT to adapt. So we need to provide more flexible solutions. Just uh, leave, a, leave a day in your user's shoes and try to design the most appropriate architecture for them um, and to provide the service they really do need. So maybe they want to, to roam from one desktop to another, from one, one site to another. And with the virtual desktop technologies, uh, and by virtual desktop, I'm including VDI, SBC, all that kind of stuff, we can provide more flexible way of working. I think instant, instant onboarding, it's just like in the same spirit. Um, flexibility and also that's more for IT. Let's say we just have to create a new users, it's onboarded, uh, everything is available, and uh, we don't have to do lots of manual tasks to onboard every new user. Perceive performance, it was matter the, the most, so it, it's really difficult also to, to say what a perceived performance is because uh, a three second difference can look like ages for a user. I, if it was faster the, the previous day and it's three seconds longer on the second day, it will be bad. Even if it's still good, that, that's the real difference between excellent, very good, good, and all users are not really sensible to the performances. We don't have that many tools to uh, monitor such performances, but at the end of the day, uh, the main point I have seen during my projects is that the logon times are most of the most important key point to have a good perceived performance. So what I spent some time talking about is how do you optimize the hypervisor and the storage subsystem for your terminal services and uh, VDI projects. So before we get into some of the specific tuning tips that we're gonna talk through, we do wanna talk about a couple other pieces of research that have been published on this that uh, definitely is something that you should check out. So uh, Jeroen van de Kamp and Ruben Sprout run a, uh, pro something called Project VRC, Project Virtual Reality Check, which uh, publishes white papers comparing hypervisor performance, pre uh, preparing different uh, optimizations within the hypervisor and changing values of memory, changing the storage subsystem, doing different things and benchmarking the performance between the systems. So uh, Jeroen is actually presenting uh, opposite of us right now. So you're obviously here, you're not there, you're not gonna catch that session. Uh, but definitely go back and review the videos on Bright Forum and go out and check out Project VRC. Some very, very good server scalability information. The next thing I wanna highlight is uh, Ruben Sprout, uh, also from Project VRC, from PQR, uh, published a white paper that uh, he worked on with another colleague, uh, Herco, and they published a white paper that talks about IOPS and storage access latency and that kind of stuff in the context of a virtual desktop environment. 
So um, we'll talk a bit about IOPS and VDI and terminal services and how they kind of compare. But if you want a lot of deep information on how storage impacts virtual desktop environments, uh, I highly recommend this article. It's published on BrianMadden.com, and it is an excellent article to get more background on how storage works uh, in these projects. The next one is a session that uh, came out in BriForum, I believe it was last year, late last year, uh, that Jim Moyle did on Windows 7 IOPS. And Jim had another session at BriForum kind of similar to this, talking about uh, Windows 8. And uh, it gives a good idea to help people understand how IOPS or how IOs per second impact a Windows 7 desktop. And you got to keep in mind that there's a lot of different uh, discussions around IOPS and, and how they impact your environment. There's bootstorm IOPS, there's logon storm IOPS, there's just people running applications in what's called steady state, which means after the person's logged on, uh, how many IOPS are going back and forth to the storage as they run their applications. And uh, it's also important that you be very careful when people say that a virtual desktop will use 10 IOPS on average. Uh, and the, what's difficult about that is, is if, you, if you take average numbers, uh, there's unfortunately going to be peaks and valleys in those averages. And if all you do is scale virtual desktops based on average IOPS, you're going to be missing those peaks that are going to end up uh, completely collapsing your storage environment. And uh, so you need to make sure that you scale on peaks and don't just scale on averages. Uh, a lot of the information that's published around IOPS says that a Windows 7 desktop or something like that is going to as assume somewhere around 10 to 20 IOPS on average during steady state, and that's a pretty decent average to assume. The problem is the peaks can be upwards of hundreds of IOPS uh, at a time, and this will end up collapsing your storage if you have uh, hundreds or thousands of people logging on at the same time. Uh, comparing the IOPS of a virtual desktop versus that of ZenApp, I can say from experience Zen app users, being that they may not be using their desktop or their published apps the entire time, the IOPS pattern is about half of that of virtual desktop. So if you're making the assumption of 10 to 20 IOPS for a Win7 VDI desktop, you can assume probably the neighborhood of about 5 to 10 IOPS for a Zen app user at steady state. But again, that's steady state, meaning that they're logged on, they're opening and closing apps, and maybe they're idle during some times and that kind of stuff. So it's not necessarily a guarantee that you're going to have 5 to 10 IOPS per Zen app user. During logon, you're going to have in the tens of or two hundreds of IOPS during that logon session. So Jim's got a great session that talks about that. And the last thing I want to mention too with respect to IOPS is you have to make sure that you're meeting people's expectations. And, and Helga Klein came up with a really great point about this uh, a couple of weeks ago on Twitter. He said, if you're taking a desktop user from an environment where they have an entire hard disk at their disposal and a typical even SATA hard disk in a desktop PC, can do sustained IOPS in the 80 to 120 IOPS uh, range. So if they're used to having that level of IOPS performance and you put them into a virtual desktop where you're giving them 10 to 20 IOPS as their only available slice based on how you scaled your storage, then under peak load times, they're going to have a very bad experience, about one-tenth of the disk I.O. performance they had on their physical desktop. The matters get worse when the person had a laptop in the past with an SSD in it or a desktop with an SSD where they have 5,000, 10,000, 40,000 IOPS at their disposal. They're used to clicking on an app and launching it and it's up in a tenth of a second. You move them into a virtual desktop environment to a shared Zen app environment. Now they're competing for IOPS with every other user on the, on the SAN and their experience may be very bad versus what they had in the past. So you need to make sure you're giving people like-like experiences. Then I published a piece of research in cooperation with Atlantis uh, Computing, uh, specifically around ZenApp server infrastructure and how the IOPS pattern operates for ZenApp uh, and how Atlantis Computing software solution can improve that scenario. So there's a white paper out on that. And then the last one I want to highlight, which is actually a pretty decent document published by Citrix Worldwide Consulting called Zen Desktop Best Practices Handbook. And the Best Practices Handbook doesn't just cover Zen App or Zen Desktop. It covers a lot of their products and talks about tuning tips and certain things like that. Now, I will say with any of these pieces of research, you need to be careful getting too committed to everything that a particular vendor or a particular consultant says. And I'll talk in specifics about one of the things that Citrix recommends later with respect to folder redirection that is just flat out bad advice I completely disagree with, and I'll show you exactly why it's bad advice. Um, but in general, a lot of these uh, white papers and guides will help you with a lot of background information that will help you be better prepared to understand how storage impacts your virtual desktop environment. And this is very true if you're making the transition from your physical Zen app servers or physical desktops into a virtualized world where you're putting these things on a, a storage subsystem. Uh, you have to really be concerned about IOPS. Yes, and we will also add some comments later, but in the real world, we have the hypervisor guys, we have the 
virtual desktop guys and uh, from a virtual desktop guy perspective, you, you know about IOPS, you care about IOPS, but from an hypervisor guy perspective, they always say our oh, hypervisor is so powerful it will consolidate everything. And they really don't know that these loads are really specific loads uh, <clears throat> and that you have to, to be careful and consider them as really specific. In large enterprise project, you may have to dedicate some storage arrays just for your virtual desktops. So that's uh, a real discussion that you, could, you, you have to start with the hypervisor guys uh, just saying that uh, a XenApp server or uh, a pool of VDI machines is just not like an Active Directory controller, controller, a SQL server, an exchange server. And from what I'm seeing is that uh, everyone thinks that virtualization will solve, solve every problem. And in this case, that's not true. And uh, uh, also the IOPS, you also have the red-white uh, percentage. Uh, these IOPS are really red-white uh, intensive. So sometimes you also have to tune the storage to deal with this. So really be careful because it can break up your project. Yeah, and the one thing that I see time and time again when I go into larger enterprises, as Pierre alluded to, there's a separate storage team, there's a separate hypervisor team, there's a separate AD team, all these kinds of things. And the, the classic mistake I see time and time again is if I'm not the person responsible for engineering the storage, and oftentimes I'm not because there's a whole department that does that, if I go to the storage people and say, I need some storage allocated for you know, 100 virtual desktops, 1,000 virtual desktops, whatever, the first question I always get back is how much space do you need? And I'm like, that is, the, that is the wrong question to be asking. If you're asking how much space you need, you're already going to fail on that project. You should be asking how much aggregate data throughput, what is your read-write ratio, uh, do you have any caching within your solution that's going to possibly improve either the write or the read performance, um, how much disk access latency on average are you having, how many spindles do you have, how many IOPS are they capable of, what is the disk access latency that the hypervisor is seeing to that storage tier. Those are the questions that are important because when we talk about perceived performance for a desktop user, you know, how much storage they have is completely irrelevant to what their performance is going to be. What matters is the throughput to the storage subsystem, the disk access latency, which you want to have definitely sub uh, 20 milliseconds, but preferably less than 10 milliseconds for good performance. Um, and make sure that you have a storage subsystem that's capable of doing the appropriate throughput. Uh, oftentimes, in virtual desktop environments, you can uh, segment up the data so that some of the common data that you would be serving in a, in a read form can be served off of some form of a caching. So PVS helps a lot with read caching. It unfortunately doesn't help with write caching. Uh, there are other solutions out there like Atlantis Computing and Versto and some of these guys that will solve some of the read and write uh, caching problems. But make sure that you understand where the storage is being served from. If you have tiered storage with SSDs or RAM caching, or if you just have a bank of spinning disk that, you know, it might be fine for serving up file servers where there's infrequent patterns of I.O., but if you're serving up virtual desktops where there's demand for, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of IOPS, if you don't scale that appropriately, people are going to have frozen desktop sessions. So be very, very careful uh, I will give a, a real life example. I was doing an audit some months ago for a customer that planned to use uh, 30,000 uh, Xenap users. So they started with a storage array that was delivering uh, 30,000 IOPS. And when I came to the storage guy to say, did you monitor anything? Yes, the average is good. So I say, okay, what's the average? It's five to 10 IOPS per user, okay. Uh, did you add, add a look at the peaks? No, so let, let's have a look at, at the peaks. Oh, yes, it's 200 IOPS per user. So then if you want to scale it for 30,000 users, you know, it's a really big storage array and they completely forgot about it because they were only looking at averages. So hopefully they decided to do an assessment before rolling out to all users, but they had a bad surprise, a big storage array to buy. So uh, it's really, really important because uh, I, I'm seeing lots of storage guides just monitoring average uh, IOPS and we really have to take care, and that's not only about IOPS, that's also for CPU, for memory, every kind of stuff at the peak levels because we have to be able to handle all the peaks. Alternatively, tell all of your users to log in one minute apart from each other. Like assign them like a ticket, like you get nine o'clock, you get 901, you get 902. I'm joking on that, of course, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's interesting because a lot of the storage benchmark solutions that people do, and even you know, Login VSI and Project VRC is kind of guilty of this because they're, they're trying to test scalability of an individual server. How many sessions can I stack in there? 
And a lot of those benchmarking tools will step users. O almost everyone, uh, uh, Rock does this with VMware and, and Login VSI does this. They step a user one every minute or two to basically offload that peak I.O. so that you don't have 200 people trying to sign out at the exact same time. That's unfortunately not what you're going to have in production. So you got to keep in mind that uh, don't assume that the login VSI scalability numbers on a single server directly equates to the performance that you're going to get because you may have 20 people signing out at the exact same time or 100 people signing out at the exact same time. So you have to make sure that you account for that. And a child follow testing can help you to do that because you can select uh, ramp up uh, yes. to, do, to do your scalability testing. And another example for, from this customer, the same one, uh, we, we, are, we are two load testing scenarios on the first one, we have 40 users on a single physical server. With the other one, we can scale up to uh, 180. Why? Just by switching a specific business applications on or off. Yeah. And then if we adapt and if we fine tune the scenarios to the real usage, usage which means they are not using all, all of the users on the single server are not using the application at the same time, we can go to 140, which is quite decent. So uh, you have to take care when you do load testings that your scenarios have to reflect the more the reality as you can. That's really important because you can have bad numbers or too optimistic numbers just because your scenarios are too, too easy or too far from reality. Yeah, that's actually a really good point we should talk about too. There's a lot of tools in the market for load testing. Uh, now Login VSI is a great tool for getting a baseline idea of how your particular storage or your particular servers are, are benchmarking. But don't make the assumption that the Login VSI medium workload is going to equate to the same user load that your applications are going to do. Um, you're going to want to either get the commercial license of VSI and, and create scripts for your specific applications, or use something like Edge Site for load testing, uh, HP Load Runner, CompuWare, any of these products, and craft your own scalability test. Or, even better yet, get a proof of concept pilot group together and have them do real work. And that way you can measure it in you know, an effective scenario with your apps and your users. So, I want to talk uh, about a couple things, uh, still regarding uh, hypervisor and storage. A very important one, particularly for virtual desktops, is not to overcommit your virtual CPU to physical CPU allocation. So if you have a 24 core server, plan to host 24 virtual desktops. Don't try doing a six to one, eight to one, 10 to one consolidation ratio. Now this doesn't necessarily apply to Zen App, because in the Zen app case, you've got a shared operating system. So some of the overhead, uh, the CPU and RAM and disk of each user is being handled by the fact that it's a terminal services session. But in the case of virtual desktops, try to avoid overcommitting. I have seen organizations that have done a two to one, three to one, four to one overcommit ratio. Um, but again, when it comes to that performance side, you may be delivering a substandard user experience. From a Xenap perspective, uh, I am used to dedicate something like one socket per VM uh, on, on a single hypervisor. And uh, if you look at pro Project VRC, that's really interesting because Xenap does not scale up by adding lots of VM, which means if you have two VMs, three VMs, or 10 VMs on a single host, you will have barely the same amount of users, but split, in, split it between the VMs. So uh, now uh, with two, two, 2008 R2, uh, from what I am saying, it's between two or three VMs on a single host, depending on uh, Windows Edition, of course, and on uh, where the application uh, locks the system, if it's CPU, memory, or all that kind of stuff. But uh, between two or three VMs, you will handle the same amount of users. Maybe it will be one or two users more, and that's it. So just don't consider that 10 VMs will handle more users than right. only one. That's not true. Yeah, in most cases with, uh, with Zen App servers or even with virtual desktops, um, it used to be that you would get memory bound, but on, on most modern servers, even with 96 gig of RAM, 192 gig of RAM, you're going to find that as you start trying to stack more virtual desktops or more Zen App servers, you're eventually going to reach a point where you're going to be CPU or disk bound, and you're not going to even be able to utilize all of that memory because you're going to be cramped somewhere else. Um, and to, and to, Pierre, to Pierre's point, when we had Server 2003 was our primary Zen App environment or XP as our primary desktop environment, um, given that those operating systems, 32-bit OSs, had four gig memory limits, we could stack a ton of users on a 64-bit server with a lot of RAM. With 2008 R2 with Windows 7 64-bit edition, uh, given that they scale much better on physical hardware versus the old four gig 32-bit OSs, 
you're not going to stack necessarily as many people as you could as you could on a physical scenario. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't virtualize the servers or virtualize the desktops because you get other benefits like motioning machines from physical hardware to physical hardware and other things like that. But you will lose some user count by virtualizing those assets. But again, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. And I agree with Pierre that thinking that you stack more VMs on the system and you're going to get more users is actually counterproductive because the additional overhead of the OS starts to get you less users. So you need to do some benchmarking on your own to find the sweet spot of how many VMs per hypervisor host is going to yield the maximum number of users. And sometimes you will also add one VM or two just because you, ju you, you want, in case of a VM crash, to lose less users. Yeah. And that's it. So that will be so somewhere the cost of flexibility, but that will ensure that I I if you lose a VM, you won't lose 100 or 200 users, for example. Yeah, there used to be a great white paper from HP, and I think Dell did their own whatever. You know, we stacked 500 users on a 2008 64-bit server, whatever. Even if you can do that, which I question the practicality of that in, in most user environments, even if you do that, what happens when you lose that physical host and 500 users are knocked out of your environment? This is not a good thing. You're better off carving up VMs that are smaller in size, and if any one of those individual VMs has a problem, you lose you know, a fifth of the users at a, at a time. So uh, as for CPUs, do not overcommit RAM. Uh, <clears throat> I would say in 64-bit OSs, they are able to, to use all their resources. And if you do overcommit, you will then have some latencies introduced when the hypervisor is overcommitting. So uh, just assign the right resources to your VM so that you ensure that even when the user is demanding more power, it will have it. And you will not rely on swapping, for example, because that's the worst case when the hypervisor starts to swap then all your VMs will have decreased performances and you will have a cra crappy user experience. Yeah, this is predominantly a VMware specific issue because the other hypervisors don't really allow overcommit in the same way. Um, you know, Zen server can do overcommit. And, and overcommit, by the way, I, I shouldn't say overcommit is always a bad thing. If you're virtualizing server workloads and you've got a server that uh, somebody said, we need four gig of RAM or eight gig of RAM on this server, and you look at it and the committed bytes on that server is only you know, a fifth of the total RAM on the box, that's a great use case for overcommitting RAM because if that box is never going to grow beyond 20% committed bytes of RAM allocation, then you can happily stack more servers on that same hypervisor host and, and be perfectly okay with that. In the case of virtual desktops uh, and Zen app servers, this is not really the case because they might start out during boot time at only five or ten percent of their RAM utilization. As users log on, that's going to go from five or ten percent up to 70, 80, 90 percent RAM allocation. And if you are over allocated on hypervisor RAM, you're over committed, then the, ho the host hypervisor is going to have to start paging that information somewhere, which is going to go to disk. The minute you touch disk, things are going to get slow. So you definitely don't want to do that. Next one, which is also very important while we talk about overcommitting RAM, don't over allocate RAM on your virtual machines, be it Zen app servers or Zen desktop servers, if you don't actually need that RAM, right? I've been in a lot of environments, I've done performance analysis for people before, where I walk into their environment and they say, oh yeah, a consultant told us that we should put 12 gig of RAM in our Zen app servers or 16 gig of RAM in our Zen app servers, and I bring up the server during the prime peak time of, of usage, and they've got five gig of committed bytes of memory, peak not you know, the current, the peak was five gig. And I'm sitting there looking at this going, you're wasting you know, about uh, seven or eight gigs of RAM on these servers because nobody's using it. So make sure you right size the environment. How do you do that? If you've got existing uh, desktop, physical desktops that you're gonna be moving into VDI, uh, use your SCCM, you know, whatever kind of management agents to collect data on how much peak memory usage is on those machines. Or use the tools from Lakeside Software, Liquidware Labs, any of these components to go out and put an agent on these machines gather up how much RAM they're currently using, and then right size them. Don't make the assumption that every desktop user needs four gig or eight gig, or every Zen app server needs 64 gig of RAM, or whatever the case may be. And also to, to get all information, load testings and uh, a pilot environment are the best way to have the real pragmatic values. Okay. So, oh, uh, we, we talked about this uh, a little oh, bit yeah, earlier, right. yes, the Xenap scalability. The other one is if you're doing uh, Zen Desktop or VMware View or whatever the case may be and you're dealing with media rich applications and I want to say media rich, I don't necessarily mean that you're talking about webcams and multimedia video. It could be you know, 3D style applications, it could be anything that's going to tax the CPU heavily or the GPU if you're using physical machines with GPUs in them. 
Um, you're, you're probably going to want to, uh, in the case of VMs, allocate two vCPUs to those kind of more media-rich machines. You can sometimes get away with one vCPU, but the problem that you'll run into is sometimes under extreme load, the, uh, the services that are necessary for Zen Desktop or Vue start to not have the, enough allocated resources to them to provide the virtual desktop experience that you're expecting, and then the user starts getting a freezing desktop and that kind of stuff. So two vCPUs for those kinds of desktops is a much better approach. Yes, and also reminds us for um, customers that have uh, high-intensive CPU applications. Yeah. If you have only one vCPU, it could be stuck, and it will stuck the whole machine. If you have two vCPUs, then the, uh, the load can be split it between the two CPUs and the, OE, the operating system can keep a little bit of it yeah. just to work and at least to be responsive. Particularly for single threaded applications or if you have an application that's altering the CPU priorities and it's running at above normal or high or something like that, it's going to completely slam your virtual desktop. So we alluded to this a little bit earlier, but uh, ZenApp IOPS are less than VDI in most cases. Like I said, you can pretty much assume about half, but again, be very careful making any assumptions about IOPS with respect to your virtual desktops or your ZenApp sessions. It is much better to benchmark it in your environment, come up with your peaks and your averages, and scale your storage appropriately based on that. Because a single, a single application can break up everything you, you have created, and I've seen that in lots of projects. Uh, an example is a customer that has migrated to Gmail. Okay, that's a main migration. They did not consider anything on the Xenap side. They just for, to, totally forgot that uh, IE was taking 180 megabytes of memory compared to Outlook that was taking 36 mega, megabytes of memory. And they have 10,000 users. So just by switching to Gmail, they added uh, memory overloads on the farm and the farm collapsed. They had to deploy in emergency new 64-bit servers just to handle IE and Gmail. So you also have to watch out every new application that is entering into the system, benchmark it, and find how it can impact your migration. You have more and more customers that are switching from old terminal applications to new web UI rich applications, and they sub substantially um, take more memory, more CPU than the old emulator that were doing barely nothing. So be careful, one single application can break everything. So just analyze them, load test them, and be sure to monitor everything before going into production. All right. So we're going to jump into Active Directory and user environment management. So uh, first thing I want to say is this isn't directly related to uh, log on times and some of that kind of stuff necessarily, but uh, definitely if you guys had a chance, uh, was it yesterday, Carl? Uh, Carl Webster up front here had an outstanding session, I saw it in San Francisco, or I saw an old version of it in San Francisco, about things in your Active Directory environment that can impact your Zen App and Zen Desktop uh, uh, environment. So if you have not seen that session, I strongly encourage after Bry Forum, once the videos are posted, go back and review Carl's session. It's an excellent topic to help you look for issues that might be causing performance problems. Yes? Right. Can you define that a little better? Okay, so as I said, if you're working in a virtual desktop environment and uh, you have, uh, a, let's say, two, two socket CPUs, each with six cores plus hyper-threading, you got 24 logical cores, uh, you don't want to have more than 24 total virtual desktops on there. And in some cases, you may want to actually even dedicate a physical core, not, not, a, not a socket core, but a, a physical core of the processor, so one of the 12 to each virtual desktop. It all depends on what your workload is and how CPU intense your applications are. What you don't want to do is have a 24 logical core processor, you're trying to stack 96 VMs on top of it because the processor scheduling in the hypervisor is going to go nuts trying to run 96 copies of the OS on 24 logical cores. So, isn't that totally yes, yes it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up because yes, a lot of the vendors say, oh, six to one, eight to one consolidation ratio and that's absolutely nuts. If you want good performance, you're going to dedicate a core per user. Because in reality, that's what they had on their physical desktop. They had two or three gigahertz to themselves, dual core, quad core processor. You're putting them in a VDI scenario, and you're going to give them a slice of one CPU. That's, that's not very good. In reality, half the users are on vacation. 
Uh, agreed, you have to account for, and that's why I said it's always important to benchmark, you can't make assumptions. There are people out here that have very simple applications, like it's just terminal emulation, that's all their users do, they do data entry into something. Those people you may be able to get away with a four to one consolidation ratio. In the market that I work in, financial services, I've got singular, singular apps that take up two to four gig of RAM per user. Those kind of applications with a slice of CPU absolutely tank. So you really have to base it on what your applications are. But generally speaking, if you want good desktop performance, you're gonna to wanna to give each user a logical core to their, to their desktop. And again, this does not apply to ZenApp necessarily where you've got shared operating system. Yes, yeah, same thing applies there. If you got dual vCPUs, you're gonna to wanna to allocate two cores to each virtual desktop user. And again, benchmark, measure it in your environment. You may get away with higher consolidation ratios, but I always say start with this and stack more users on as you can, as you do your testing. Don't start the other way with an eight to one consolidation ratio and then find out, oh my God, this is tanking. Yes, and also uh, when the hypervisor goes nuts, all VMs go nuts also, yeah. and nothing is working anymore. And in some worst cases, you have to reboot the hypervisor. So it's really risky to experiment this in production. Yes. So if you're, if you're confused on that one-to-one -one ratio, it kind of blows out the cost model for some of the IMS cases. Mm -hmm. Is that based upon a concurrency of activity? Meaning, you know, in server based computing, we'll find that people being logged on doesn't necessarily mean they're generating workload, right? Right. You absolutely have to, and here's the thing I tell people to be very careful about when you look at how you scaled ZenApp to how you scale virtual desktop environment. Um, if you're one of those ZenApp customers that used a lot of published applications because you had physical desktops and then you had a few published apps that they were stitching into their physical desktop, those kind of scenarios you will absolutely have very, very low utilization on because people are task switching between applications. They're only using your ZenApp published app you know, 5% of their day or 10% of their day, so they're gonna sit idle 80% of their time within the ZenApp session. If you're doing ZenApp published desktops, where they've got a thin client connecting to a ZenApp published desktop, or if you're doing VDI desktops, there oftentimes is not nearly as much idle time because for them to click on the start menu is activity. For them to open Outlook is activity. Them doing anything in their virtual desktop is activity. So you can't make the same assumptions about how things were in the ZenApp world versus how they are in the virtual desktop world because the activity levels are a lot higher. Yes, people take coffee breaks, yes, people take phone calls, but if this is my virtual desktop and that's all I have and I have no local operating system, then I'm gonna be a lot more active in my virtual desktop than I was in the past with the Zen app published app. Yes, and also, users don't want to wait for the hypervisor to have resources just to work. They need the power, uh, they want it. You know, we, we can't say, uh, yes, we designed it for 50% uh, concurrent activity, and when it's, it's 70, oh, we forgot about it. We just assumed it was not possible. So we have to be careful because that kind of crap user experience can also kill a project. So to close the loop on that, so you, you, it's not a blanket assumption one to one vCPU versus physical CPU. What you're saying is when you put your virtual desktops on the platform, monitor your workload, and then just decide whether you go two to one or three to one based upon what you're seeing. Exactly. Yes. The, the starting yeah. point is best to start off with one to one vCPU to physical CPU on a per user basis. And what you're gonna to wanna to do is, depending on your hypervisor and what tools you have available, you're gonna monitor the scheduler's busyness with that virtual desktop load. So in the case of VMware, you look for a CPU percent ready time, which basically refers to how much the, uh, the hypervisor is busy scheduling CPU resources. And if those numbers are good, you can try a two to one consolidation ratio, re-monitor your percent ready, and so, so on and so forth. But never go into a virtual desktop project making an assumption of an eight to one consolidation ratio, because you may be completely out of whack when it comes to actually putting that out there. Yes, and don't listen to marketing documents. Yes. No, because their load testing are based on Notepad or something, and that's not a real user activity. Yeah, and this is, you know, Citrix and VMware are both guilty of publishing these results, and so is HP and Dell and every other vendor. You know, six to one, eight to one, 10 to one consolidation ratios. It's just not true in practice. Again, depending on your applications. So topics of interest, um, we're gonna talk about uh, OU structure and group policy. We're gonna talk about registry hacks versus administrative templates versus group policy preferences. We'll talk about home drives, talk about folder redirection, and we'll talk about logon scripts. So first thing I wanna talk about is OU structure and group policy. 
Uh, one of the important things you want to do is make sure that you're creating an OU structure for your virtual desktops or your Zen app servers. And it's a really good idea, if possible, to segment those OUs based on whether it's a dev environment, a UAT environment, the prod environment, maybe inside your prod environment, have separate OU structures if you have different configurations of server silos. The reason why you want to do this is because then you can apply specific policy settings to you know, unique virtual desktop users or Zen app sessions based upon their location in Active Directory. And I always try to tell people too, it's a very good idea if you make your OU structure within uh, Active Directory mimic what you have in your ZenApp infrastructure. And the reason why that's very important is just visually looking at your ZenApp console, you can get a very good idea sort of uh, what policies are applying to which servers just through visual inspection. So that's a very good thing. You can leverage DPO hierarchy to make a lot of your common settings apply across all your servers identically. So if I have a root node underneath my servers OU that contains ZenApp and inside of ZenApp I've got my dev, UAT, and, and prod. Uh, OUs and inside of prod, I've got some sub OUs below that. Take all of your base common settings that you want to apply across all of your ZenApp servers, put them in a GPO at the top level, group policy will let it flow through, and then you can create specific overrides for certain settings that need to be unique to each OU and apply them at that OU level. Uh, if possible, block inheritance at the top OU level, and I'll explain why this is sometimes a good idea. I've worked in customer environments before where they have a sort of a def default server policy. And this default server policy is something that the Active Directory team created that they say, these are all the things we want to lock down in our environment. But when they lock down servers, they're locking them down from the perspective of nobody should be logged on interactively at a desktop doing what a normal user does. When you go into a virtual desktop or terminal server uh, shared desktop scenario, these are pretty much functionally equivalent to what people would do on physical PCs. So you can't make the same assumptions about locking things down in a Zen app or Zen desktop environment that you would make about a server environment. So this is really applicable to Zen app. Good example of this, I had a customer that made a default server policy setting that uh, disallowed print redirection for terminal services. And if you disable print redirection on terminal services in group policy, it affects every single WinStation listener. So RDP is impacted and ICA is impacted. So in a circumstance like that, you get no print redirection on, on terminal services on, on ICA because they shut it off on RDP in order to prevent people from passing through print drivers via point and print into the, into the server sessions. So a circumstance like that would be very helpful to block policy inheritance. The one thing I'll tell you to be careful of with this is if you block policy inheritance within Active Directory, you need to make sure that you either uh, don't block inheritance or if you do block it, you need to reestablish all the baseline policies that were set in the default server policy in your Citrix server policy. Otherwise, you might have servers that don't adhere to the compliance policy and audit and so on and so forth. The other one I want to talk about is monolithic versus functional GPOs. And, and I am not a, a, a super uh, group policy expert, so uh, you can certainly check this with other people who are involved in group policy a lot more intimately than I am. But uh, there's a big debate uh, with sysadmins about whether you should create sort of one singular GPO that contains all the settings that are necessary, or if you should break them up into functional GPOs that each GPO has a certain set of settings in it. Now, I won't tell you one way is right or wrong necessarily. What I will tell you is that the old notion that having too many GPOs necessarily impacts your performance is not necessarily true. The way that group policy works is if I have 15 policy objects that all have normal managed GPO settings that don't involve client-side extensions. So client-side extensions are things like group policy preferences, folder redirection, so on and so forth. If the policy settings don't contain a client-side extension, there is really little to no performance impact of multiple policy objects. So if you had some managed GPO settings that were across 10 different GPOs, it's not going to slow things down. However, if you made 10 different GPOs that each one contained a folder redirection policy or each one contained group policy preferences, that will absolutely impact your performance. So when you have things affecting client-side extensions, try to group those together in the least number of GPOs possible. But don't make the assumption that everything has to be in one policy object for performance reasons. Does that make sense? OK. And then the last one I want to talk about, or it's not the second to last one here, uh, if you use multiple different domain environments, I have a lot of customers that have completely isolated domains that there are no trust between the domains. If you create GPO objects and you assign permissions to non-built-in groups, 
You have specific domain groups in your domain that you assign certain things to. Keep in mind that when you do a backup and restore operation or move GPOs between domains, that those domains are, those domain permissions are going to become orphaned because the SID is unknown to the other domain object. So you may want to go in there and actually, instead of embedding the group name, instead embed the actual AD SID so that you can move those policies between domains. <coughs> Otherwise, you'll have to go back in and edit the policy and re-add the group membership for, uh, uh, for I will also what? add something regarding the GPOs. I like to use clear naming convention yes. for my GPOs. And also, if, if it's for Xenap or Xen Desktop, clearly indicate that it's for Citrix or Xenap or Xen Desktop so that you will avoid AD guys maybe to break down your GPOs. Good point. And I also like to add a versioning a num revision number in the name so that everywhere, um, when we have to modify it, we can notify to other admin we have a new version. And uh, it also allows you to create a copy of the GPO with a new version number and eventually test it and then put it into production. Um, that makes life easier and that will also prevent everything to be broken after you left. Because from what I'm seeing a lot, um, all consultants are doing the project, then it's rolling out in production and one month later it's not working anymore. So we also have to take care of all things that could help the day-to-day -day administrative tasks to be automated or uh, more easy to do. So be a good citizen, document, revision control your GPOs. And by the way, I'll make a plug if you are a SA or MDOP customer, the Advanced Group Policy Management Console tool that comes with MDOP is an excellent tool for managing GPO revision control and check-in and check-out and that kind of stuff. Uh, if you implement it correctly, which I have customers that don't implement it correctly, but if you implement it correctly, it can be a very effective way to check out a GPO, make a quick change, the change is then documented within the tool, and you can deploy it. And if anything goes wrong with that GPO change, you simply check it out, revert to the prior version, check it back in, and, and away you go. So excellent tool for managing change within group policy. So you want to take a couple of these and... Just talk. <laughs> Okay, so one of the things that I see a lot of times in customer environments is I've got a set of registry entries I want to make to my servers to tune the environment or something like that. And one of the big mistakes I see a lot of people do is wrap that up into some kind of registry file and they put it into their server build and it merges the registry entries and it's now baked into the server build. Or if you're using PVS, they go in and make all these reg hacks and seal up the image. And the biggest problem I see with that is that that intelligence gets lost as that image goes through revisions. Somewhere along the way, someone reverts to a previous image or they build an image fresh and they don't put those optimizations in there and that stuff is gone forever. And maybe it introduces an application problem, either a crash issue or a performance problem, and nobody has any idea why this worked two years ago and doesn't work today. So I strongly recommend any kind of registry settings or tuning tips you need to make to your servers, strongly consider you put those into either an ADM template uh, or into group policy preferences. We'll talk about which one is, in my mind, better, um, but that's it's certainly up for debate in certain scenarios. And also uh, try to automate every change so that it's stored in a script or anywhere and you could use it later. I have lots of customers when we were migrating, we just found that everyone was going Let's say 10 people were going on the server changing registry acts to make some applications working. And then 10 years ago, how does it work? We don't know. Let's, let's try to find some documentation that is 10 years ago old. And then if you do everything in scripts with SCCMs, with Alteris or, or other kind of deployment software, you have a trace and you can then reuse it when you are migrating or upgrading your systems. And this can be very dangerous too. I had a customer environment a couple of years ago that used to use server images uh, with Altiris to clone boxes and they'd, they'd take a box out of one silo, make some software changes to it, redeploy it. And sometimes those images would get reused because someone would say, oh, this, this silo already has you know, Office 2003 pre-configured. We need Office 2003 for our application. So we'll just take that server image and use it as a baseline to start off our new application install. But then you end up finding weird things like somebody made a registry edit on this server for a particular seamless flags entry that is now over on this server and it's affecting the application and you don't know why and you got to do a lot of digging to, to research that. So definitely don't put those in images and don't uh, make the reg hacks manually. Now, there's two ways that you can put uh, predefined settings into a server besides scripting mechanism. You can use administrative templates, which is an old legacy uh, methodology that existed uh, for, for a long time now, or you can use group policy preferences. And my personal preference is group policy preferences. Uh, and the reason for that is because administrative templates are very, very cumbersome to edit. It's very easy to screw them up. 
Uh, so uh, group policy preferences is very simple. If you go to make a registry change, you paste in the key, you paste in the value name, you say either update or, or replace, and the, the value applies onto your server. Uh, if you're using group policy preferences, this is supported on XP in 2003 with that hotfix, the KB943729. 2008, 2008 R2, Vista 1.7, baked into the product automatically. No th nothing additional you have to do. Do you want to talk about the templates? <coughs> templates? Yes. Um, the, what, what is really great with ADMs is that you, see, you, you can still document settings, can still enable them or disable them quite quickly. And you can also have an in, inline help subsystem, which you won't have using group policy preferences, for example. And uh, for some settings that won't change really uh, dynamically, it's still a good way, even if you still have to write your own IDMs by yourself. And you can easily create a policy, uh, an IDM template with all your user settings or tuning settings, for example, and use it it will be easier that document every registry value, for example, and you will still have the inline, inline help system that will explain you what every setting is doing. You also have all text boxes, display, uh, display list boxes, uh, and check boxes, so you can have more complex settings uh, with multiple values, and that's something you, it, that will be difficult yeah. to do in GPP, for yeah, with example. GPP, you pretty much have to distribute a set of settings that someone is going to either enable or disable you can't distribute a policy setting that lets the user choose five different options with a help text subsystem with each option explaining what they do. GPP is sort of a, this is the setting or it's not the setting. You don't get the same capabilities to allow people to customize what settings they want to choose. The other area that ADMs are still nice for that GPP doesn't really solve is if you don't have a good change management system for your group policies like AGPM, uh, as Pierre talked about, having a revision control process to know what got modified in the policy. ADMs are nice because all the content is maintained in a file that can be put out into the GPO container. You can back up and keep history of multiple ADM templates, so it's very easy to know what you changed over time within the ADM. So group policy preferences, if uh, you guys are not familiar with this, is an extremely flexible, powerful system for maintaining virtual desktops in Zen App sessions. You can do pretty much anything you need to do within your desktop environment in terms of creating shortcuts, making registry changes, um, uh, putting down drive mappings, uh, all, all sorts of configuration settings. And the one very, very flexible thing about group policy preferences that I really, really like is in normal GPO, I only have really two ways to control what settings apply to users. I can either use a WMI filter, which is uh, painful from a performance perspective, uh, or I can use um, the application level of what OU the person's in or what domain group they're in uh, for applying the GPO. But I have to go through and link my GPOs and do all these kind of crazy things. What I can't do within GPO is at an individual item level control what setting applies to what user. And that's where item level targeting in GPP really shines. Within item level targeting in GPP, I can do things like say, this registry setting only applies to this domain group, this registry setting only applies to this domain group, or these people get this drive mapping, these people don't. And all of that can be contained in one single GPP uh, GPO object, and I can do item level targeting for every individual setting, applying it to each person uniquely. So there's a lot of very, very complex filtering and applications within group policy preferences. So I say it's, it's definitely much more flexible. Uh, if you guys are new to group policy preferences, this link uh, from Microsoft gives you a very good introductory overview, letting you know what it's capable of, how you implement it. It's an excellent solution. Uh, if you're still using registry hacks or administrative templates, you want to learn more about GPP. So GPP can replace logon scripts completely. The one thing you gotta be careful of with group policy preferences, and, and Pierre's talked about this before, you wanna? Yes, it, that it, it's really cool for uh, small complexity environments. Because when you have lots of items to process, then it can really uh, add delay to your logons. And you will have processing group policy one, processing group policy two, and it can add up to one or two minutes or s even even more minutes to your logons because it, it is processing lots of objects and uh, with lots of complex filters. So it's really great when you have a few drive to map, for example, a few registry settings to pass, uh, even some kind of environment variables. But uh, if you have tons of shortcuts to create, tons of drives to map, just forget about it. Designing a right login script, and we'll talk about best practices in login script a little bit later, will be really better. And also, 
uh, if you have complex environments to manage, that's also where UEM solutions can help you while maintaining decent log on times. And, and going back to that last bullet point, again, GPP is a client-side extension, so you don't want to have GPP settings littered across 20 different GPOs, because it's really going to impact your, uh, your log on time. But if you do this, you will lose some kind of features which change management. Yeah. So that's also a limitation of the system. If you want to remove a shortcut, you need to create a new settings to uh, cancel the former set, the, the previous setting and uh, remove the shortcut. So it can be really painful to manage in a day-to-day -day, uh, workspace management. Right. Let's talk about home drives. <clears throat> so for home drives, there's uh, really two different sets of home drives that are going to get involved in your environment. If you have legacy applications, and, and legacy doesn't mean that it was a piece of software written 10 years ago. It could be a piece of software written yesterday the developer just doesn't understand terminal services. Uh, so legacy applications basically means that the TS aware bit has not been set when that executable was compiled and linked. When you link an executable with a compiler, you can specify a TS aware bit flag. And what the TS aware bit flag does is disable two things in terminal services that have been there since the product was originally created by Citrix. Uh, one is something called shadow key mapping. Uh, which if any of you guys have ever taken my training class, I talk a lot about shadow keys and how it can cause all sorts of weird registry settings getting lost and reintroduced in your terminal server environment. The other thing that it does is something called any file mapping. And what any file mapping does is when you log on to a terminal server environment as a user, if an application is installed in any file, it will install it into the C Windows folder. But users can't write to C Windows by default, so terminal services will clone a copy of that any file and stick it into their home drive. Now, where their home drive is located depends on whether or not um, they are TS aware or not with their running applications. So if I have a legacy app, I'm going to have a home drive that will be defined on my ADUC profile tab. Or if you do it in group policy, you can define those there as well. You'll also have something called a terminal services home drive. Now, the terminal services home drive may end up being the exact same network drive location as your home drive. And where this causes a big problem is if I have a London-based user logging onto a Chicago-based terminal server, their home drive, their F drive, will be in a London file server. When they log on to terminal services in Chicago, their, their normal home drive, their F drive, will be in London, but their TS home drive will also be in London. And how TS home is really, really problematic is that applications that are not TS aware, when they request what the home drive location is, a DLL called tsappcmp.dll, Terminal Services App Compat, is an operating system shim that will lie to the application uh, and tell it that the home drive is located elsewhere. And this is needed again. If I have a centralized any file that each person needs a rewrite copy of, I have to duplicate these any files and put them in the home drive. And what this ends up doing is redirects C windows to F windows. But again, if C windows is actually on F windows, and if F is in London and my terminal server is in Chicago, then every single time it needs to read or write a need file, it has to go across the WAN. But it's even worse than that, because since it's the Windows directory, every time a DLL opens, one of the first things it does is says, where is this thing located? And it will always end up checking the current working path where the executable is running, Then the next place it goes is to Winder. Well, Winder is in London. So every single time a DLL needs to be loaded by that application, it's going to go across to London and see if it's there. Now, it'll take a fraction of a second to look and see, oh, no, it's not there. But each time it goes to that directory for every single DLL and EXE, it's going to compound and add a huge performance problem. So let's talk about what this actually does. And we've got a fun little video for you guys to see. Let me put this on monitor two here. Can everyone see that OK? So let me walk over and kind of talk about what's going to happen here. So the first thing is I've got a little script that's going to launch WordPad on a Zen app server. And I started a timer. I kind of did them both at the same time. They're synchronized. Ignore my license warning. I'm a partner. So, so that happened in 7.84 seconds. So I launched WordPad, got logged onto my server, policy processing, logon script, everything, WordPad, seven seconds. Now what I'm going to do is use Shunra, which is a WAN emulation software, to create a simulation that my home drive is really located in London. So 90 milliseconds of latency, and I think I did 8 megabits of bandwidth. So I'm going to ping my home server, and you see now that I've got 92 milliseconds to where my F drive is located. Now I'm going to do the exact same test. And again, this is with an application that would not necessarily be TS aware. This is what your user sees, absolutely nothing. They assume the server's slow, it's you know, taking a long time to log on, whatever the case may be. Still waiting. We'll get there eventually. Are you waiting to see what 
90 milliseconds of round trip. <laughs> <laughs> Almost there. Hang in there. Voila, word pad. 45 seconds. So why did this take so long? I'm going to show you guys an actual Procmon capture taken from a different launch attempt to show you what actually happens in here. You see up at the top, there's some uh, create file, query path info calls for the network file server with my test user account. It's also trying to load user log on CMD, which is a script that runs inside of each terminal server off the local drive. Here we've got imacommon.dll, which is a Citrix DLL, being pulled off of that network drive. Now, just to show you guys how we can fix this, now we're going to set a TS home drive to the local server location so it's not going across the WAN. All you do for this is go to Remote Desktop Services Profile, set a local path, or set it to a network UNC path where your terminal server home drive is central to where your RDS server is. Now we're going to do the exact same thing, just showing you the WAN emulation is still on. We're going to ping it just to verify. We're still in London. The only difference here now is I've got my F drive in London, but I've got a terminal server home drive now in Chicago. So any of those requests for F windows are going to be sourced locally. Now we're do the same thing. Start our timer, and it's going to come back roughly seven seconds again, the exact same performance timing we'd expect without the network home drive. And there we go, 7.89 seconds. It was probably actually faster than that. I think I was a little slow clicking it. So just to give you an idea what can happen if you have legacy style applications with, uh, with the TS home drive. So let's get back to where we were. Maybe we should do the page edit. Yeah, I think so too. We'll have to speed up a little bit here. Yes. I think we can skip the end of UEM or something. You know? Where is it? There we go. Sorry, guys. So that's how legacy applications work with the terminal services thing. Modern applications or applications that have the TS aware bit set don't do that Windows drive substitution because the application doesn't use any files, it doesn't need shadow keys, doesn't need all that kind of stuff. So if your TS aware bit is set during compilation and linking, you won't have this problem. So then you only have the home drive, you don't have TS home, you don't have the performance problem I just showed you. How do you know if your apps are, are, are TS aware or not? There's a great utility from a consultancy in New York called IPM called TS flag. And there's another utility called is TS aware from Helga Klein. You can run this against all of your executables and determine if they're TS aware or not. Using the IPM utility can also toggle the TS aware status of the app to prevent this behavior. The other thing you can do is you can use group policy to assign a TS home drive to the users to keep that local to where your terminal servers are to prevent this issue. Folder redirection. So a couple things. If you read the Citrix Zen desktop practices, they will tell you to redirect every single folder in the desktop environment. So my docs, desktop, app data, favorites, cookies, this, that, the other. Redirect everything off to the network file server. That is the worst possible thing you can ever do in your environment. Um, a better approach is redirect folders that are not necessarily going to cause UI deadlocks. So what do I mean by a UI deadlock? I mean that I run an application and it needs to fetch some piece of data from that remote file share just to load the app or to perform, perform its normal operations. My docs and desktop are rarely folders that will get in the way of a running application. One app that does actually do this is Business Objects. It uses the My Docs folder, so that can be uh, impacted from a performance perspective. But all the other folders out there, uh, like App Data, is a particularly bad one. So is Favorites. You don't want to redirect those. So avoid App Data, avoid Favorites. Start menu is iffy. If you need to redirect Start menu to do some kind of a centralized shortcut delivery, then Start menu is kind of OK. But be aware that any of these folders I reference here, app data favorites, start menu, also local uh, uh, app data, very, very bad to redirect. And sometimes you are just forced to do this. For example, if you restrict the C drive on XenApp servers on our virtual desktops, then uh, the start menu search won't be working if you still use uh, a local start menu. So you have to redirect it for the start menu search to, to work. And that's the same for favorites. As long as you enable the C drive restriction, user won't have access to the favorites folders. So uh, sometimes if you want to do lots of best practices restrictions, you will have to redirect folders to get all features still working. Let me show you really quickly what happens with app data redirection. So this is a timed launch of Firefox that is locally installed on site of a, uh, actually it's not even a terminal service case, it's a Windows 7 workstation. But the same thing applies for VDI and terminal services. So we're going to have a script that's going to launch Firefox. And I'm showing you right here that the app data folder right now is currently local. It's inside the user profile. 
Now I'm using Fraps for video recording in this case, but I'm gonna launch Firefox and it takes 950 milliseconds before Firefox is ready for user input. This app is now ready to go. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna redirect it to a network file server. So I'm putting this nickel server, app data is located on there, and I'm gonna do the, basically the same test. Okay, now it comes up 1,124 milliseconds. I'm now 18% slower going against a file server that has literally zero users. It's doing absolutely nothing right now, and I'm 18% slower just by redirecting. Now I'm gonna have the redirection to that location, but I'm gonna create some load against that file server. I'm using Iometer, which is a very heavy stress test, but having, oh, I don't know, 1,000 users use the same file server might create similar load. So we're gonna kick off Iometer, we're gonna create some load against that file server, now we launch Firefox and see what happens. Now notice that Firefox had some CPU, and now it has no CPU. Why does it have no CPU? Because it has nothing to do. It's waiting on network I.O. It's trying to pull in its profile data from the app data folder in order to load my, my Firefox profile settings. No CPU whatsoever. It's just sitting there waiting for network I.O. Keep going. Time goes by. Again, this is on a physical desktop. This is not even VDI or terminal server. If you just do redirection on a normal Win7 desktop, you can have this. Users waiting, we got a little CPU blip there, it did something, still waiting again on I.O. <laughs> if you had it on Citrix, they'd be upset. Anyway, we keep going, finally comes back 45 seconds later. So, why did it take 45 seconds? Because every single request it made to the app data folder had to go to the file server. The file server was busy, it couldn't answer the request, so the user just got stuck in a wait state loop, waiting for that I.O. to come back. This could be very, very dangerous in your environment. So I say, don't redirect app data. Instead, either put it in the profile, let it copy up and down, uh, or use uh, UPM profile streaming to let that stuff stream down on demand. So I've talked about folder redirection. The other one too, manage folder redirection. If you use folder redirection within group policy, this is actually quite slow. And the reason why it's quite slow is when you do folder redirection with group policy, it has to go in and check permissions, assign the user, maybe copy some data up or down from their physical desktop. This can be very expensive from a time perspective. It may add you know, a second or two to your logons. Alternatively, if you've pre-provisioned all of the uh, folders, like the My Documents folder and that kind of stuff, and it's all permissioned ahead of time, you can just inject a registry value into user shell folders, or use a third-party uh, user environment management solution, do the folder redirection in there. Yes. Maybe we should go to turning. turning sure. No. Because I have 10 minutes left. Yeah, do you want to talk login scripts? Uh, just about login script. Do not use PowerShell for login script because it's really high CPU intensive and quite slow because it needs lots of shared DLLs to be loaded. Instead, instead prefer VBS, for example. That's really fast. And just do uh, wise login script. Try to optimize them. And they would be even faster than um, GPPs, for example. Right. But they will requ require lots of work to manage them. So it's well, always pro and cons for login scripts. We're but running short on time, so we're going to skip over the third-party UEM stuff. You guys can read this after the fact, because we're running out of time. Let's, yes. let's talk optimizations. So some very, very simple stuff that I say, the keep it simple, stupid optimization. Have you audited all the running services on your servers to determine if you need them or not? If not, shut them off. You'll save tens or hundreds of megabytes of RAM, really help you. Have you audited user processes, particularly in Zen App? Are you running language bar? Are you running acro tray? Are you running you know, all these different components that maybe don't need to be running? If you save 10, 20 megabytes per process, that means you're gonna get a couple of extra users on each server. Watch out for excessive disk I.O. I had an application that wrote verbose debug logs when the user started it. This gave us 10 users on a, on a dual processor server. Uh, this is a couple of years back now. We turned off the verbose logging. We were running 80 to 90 production users on that same server hardware. So watch out for disk I.O. Always recommend use process monitor on your servers and track what kind of file I.O. that's happening on your servers. Keep in mind, when you run process monitor, it's gonna cause a performance hit to your server. So only monitor for a short period of time, turn it off, analyze the log after the fact. AV, yeah. only scan on writes, don't scan on reads ideally. And if you make, uh, you wanna make intelligent AV exclusions, don't let antivirus scan database files or scan log files or source code repositories, things that you know are already clear of viruses. And if you're using a sealed antivirus image, pre-scan it in order to build up the signature database before you clone that out to your virtual desktops. So, 
Uh, it's extremely important to baseline your server performances. You have lots of tuning tips uh, to, to optimize it, but you still have to test them. Um, you have lots of uh, tuning guides uh, on the internet, but beware of every tuning can have a side effect. And I've talked with lots of people using tuning tips without understanding what it was doing, and that had some side, bad side, side effects. So uh, test them, then release them into production, and never forget that you tune the system, because it can have uh, a side effect. So uh, be very careful. And some best practices, like disabling cursor blink, for example, in Xenap or Xen desktop environment, can break some apps. So I had an app as well that you disable 8.3 namespace creation. So creating the short file names will break any kind of 16-bit component uh, or installer routine right. of 16 bits. So you got to be very careful. With and that. actually, it will break the OS because some yeah. part of the OS are still using yeah. the, old, the old convention. So uh, regarding the tuning, you can have general, general OS performance tuning, TCP IP optimization, SMB optimization, and you will find lots of them uh, for server two, 2003 to uh, 2008 and for 2008 or to onsitresource.net with lots of comments on potential side effects that they could have. Um, let's go maybe. Uh, you do this? So yeah, I'll run through this really quick. So other things, you want to make sure if you're using published desktops or BDI desktops that you're not having Windows installer self-healing happening. Windows installer, if there's an advertised feature that has a shortcut or a register entry that's not there, it will try to self-heal and repair that application. This is a very, very CPU intense process. Find out what the advertised features are by looking through the event log for 1104 events, and then go back and edit your MSIs to remove those features and republish your apps that way. Active setup, very old legacy technology, it's still out there on all your terminal servers, runs for every user that logs on, also runs on Windows 7 desktops, saps resources when you sign on, particularly if you don't have a good profile management solution, so you want to go through and eliminate active setup. And we will show you, just to conclude, a video. That's something I've noticed, and maybe you have noticed it, when you schedule reboots, some, some companies want to reboot their server daily, for example, or they already reboot their virtual machines just after a user logs off. And there are lots of impact of re rebooting a server. Because typically, if, even if it's a server or VM, Windows works with loading the component in shared memory. And it's loading them at the first logon, or at the first time a user is working on the workstation. And uh, the video we will show will compare two virtual Xenap desktops connecting to the same demo center environment. So it's a really, really small environment with uh, an ASXN, lots of VMs. But the, on, on the right side, you have the second logon. And on the left side, you have the first logon. And look at the differences between the two logons on the same server. But the, the one on the left side won the, first, the very first logon after the server reboot. So, we are still waiting while it took uh, 19 seconds, even using the Hyatt uh, Wi-Fi to connect. It took uh, 19 seconds, and then on the left side, we are still waiting. So uh, what can we do just to prevent this? Just have wise reboot cycles, and also I will publish it in, in some weeks. Uh, have an autologon user that will launch some applications and then close them gracefully. I will publish a little exe file to do this, and to preload everything. And that's also more important in PVS environment because it's preloading the cache. So you, won't, you will have uh, less high impact when the user will log in on the next morning. So no, Windows is loading everything. We are still waiting. We don't have the environment. No, it's ready. So look, 83 seconds, 19 seconds, same server very first logon after reboot. So when your users say it's slow, it may be because of such effects, because they are, the f they are going to the very first server. So if you boot every day, all your users can have this experience. So even if it's small VMs, so it will be um, faster, but you can see it's really important to do this. So to Pierre's point, if you have terminal server farms that you reboot, may not be a bad idea to get a user to sign on to each system. Uh, as, as a scripted, unattended process to get that preloading of the cache and preloading of your virtual applications if you have those, and launching the initial terminal services processes for that first user session, it will really improve uh, the, the performance. Yes, so 
Uh, OS hotfixes, very yeah. important. Citrix has a published KB article, 129229. A lot of good OS hotfixes in there uh, to improve performance for 2008 R2 for your Zen app environment. No. So, uh, at the end of the day, passive performance is the most important. Uh, just take this video as re the old video as a reference. Do you want a 90 second login or 29 one? You know, that, that's what your user are expecting. Uh, so, uh, we have to work on everything that can improve the experience uh, to get instant app access or all that kind of stuff. Sometimes it's just been being a little bit smart, like uh, using an auto logon user with some scripts and then have a log off just after the reboot so that you could really improve the experience. And at, at the end of the, of the day, for the user, it's just wow instead of oh, it sucks. So it's really important uh, to focus on this. And also everything that you can do to simplify the user experience. Just like uh, I have a customer, it, it was not, the user was not, were not complaining, but every time they had to launch uh, an HTTPS application, they had to add the certificates into the browser. So we just scripted it so that they don't have to do it. You know, it's just making the solution the most automated possible way. And f at the end of the day, for the user, it just click on the shortcut, it's working. You don't have to click in some dark windows to add a certificate it does not care about, for example. One, two. So ZenApp and Zen Desktop out of the box are not tuned, tuned for performance. They're tuned to kind of be general, general purpose platforms. You want to spend some serious time uh, uh, looking at your environment. Uh, you're going to want to do a baseline system performance analysis. Never, ever make performance tuning before you baseline your server, because otherwise you won't know if the performance tuning improved or made things worse. So it's always very important to baseline performance. The other thing I'll say, too, is that logon time is important. Obviously, you want your users to be happy. You want them to have fast logons. And again, we talked before, logons should be less than 30 seconds, preferably between 7 and 15 seconds. Uh, if you've got two-minute logons, you want to make that better. But keep in mind, don't follow Citrix's advice by doing all this crazy folder redirection, because while you might get your logons down to 15 seconds, you make their application performance suffer for the entire eight-hour day. Personally, me, I'd rather have a 30-second logon and great performance than have a 15-second logon with bad application performance. So don't sacrifice the whole day just for fast yes, logons. Yes, and, and be wise with profile, which means monitor your applications where they are writing so that you can exclude some directories, for example, Java temporary directories, just to have smaller profiles and better user experience while not sacrificing performances, for example. I don't know that we have any uh, time for questions. I think we have about like a minute, not even that, 30 seconds, we're out. <laughs> so uh, thank you guys for coming. Thank really you. Really appreciate it.